Good morning. We're once again on the record in the case of People v. Simpson. The defendant is present with counsel. The people are represented. Um, Ms. Clark, for purposes of clarifying the record with regard to the specific items of physical evidence that um, we're dealing with in this motion, um, you had indicated to the court that the people were only going to be offering some items that were not recovered after the execution of the search warrant. Is that correct? That's correct. And those items are the glove, in essence, that was uh, found in that pathway behind the guest quarters. Is that right? That's one. Uh, some blood stains from the driveway area. That's correct. And the blood stain from the door of the Bronco. That's correct. Any other items? Yes, Your Honor. And what would those be? That would be the uh, blood, one of the blood stains leaving the crime scene at Bundy, at the Bundy address. All right, but that's not part of this motion, I assume. No. Okay. So it's those four items, or excuse me, three items of physical evidence from the uh, Simpson home and grounds or vehicle that is the subject of the motion to suppress. It, it might be, in general, yes, Your Honor, that's correct. It might be more than three items because there are a number of blood spots on the driveway. Okay. But collectively, that, that's correct, those three places. And those items are enumerated in the property report somewhere in items 1 through 11? That's correct, Your Honor. Okay. All right. Uh, I believe that the detective, Herman, is still on the witness stand. Sir, if you retake the stand, you've yes, previously been sworn and remain under oath. <coughs> Your Honor, with uh, respect to the limitation of the scope of this motion, we'd like to make it clear for the record that the defendant will then reserve a de, de novo hearing on the issues raised by the motion to quash the search warrant uh, prior to trial. And that is not being addressed in this motion. That's correct. The people have indicated that they're not offering any of the items that were recovered in the execution of the warrant, and therefore the warrant would not be an issue in this proceeding. Thank you. Uh, Detective Furman, uh, we have located the notes that uh, you made uh, in the course of your investigation in uh, the murder book at pages 00198 through 00200. Did you review those before you testified? Um, no, I didn't. Uh, would you like to review them? I, I don't think it would be necessary. If Maybe during the questioning, if you, if you need to show it to me, I would All like right. to. All uh, right. The notes uh, begin uh, with your uh, observations uh, upon your arrival at the scene at 0210, right, in the morning? Uh, yes, sir. Now, you indicate in these notes that uh, Officer Risky received a radio call, quote, possible 459, suspects there now, 874 South Bundy. Is that a direct quotation of the radio call? Well, as much as uh, it was relayed to me, and at that time I didn't know the, uh, the weight of that call, if it was uh, part of the uh, homicide scene. Uh, or it was something independent, and that was Officer Risky um, giving me that information. Uh, I picked up on that. I just made a notation to question him later. All right. A possible 459 re refers to a possible burglary, is that correct? Yes, sir. And uh, it refers to plural suspects. Was it your understanding that there were suspects who were observed at the scene? I, I had no other knowledge other than what he told me. I didn't pursue it at that point. Uh, he was just briefing us slightly on the, on the scene, what he knew, then he took us into the scene. So I just made a notation. And uh, you also noted where that original uh, call came from, that a resident of 874 heard something across the street? I'm sorry, would you repeat resident that? Resident of 874 heard something across the street? That's just what Officer Risky said. Again. The way I take notes is I uh, put a numeral by each uh, notation, and then as I go back 
and start doing the investigation, I'll refer back to that note number and then write maybe a, as much as several pages on one uh, area that I have to go back to. These are just quick notes that I made the very first few minutes that I was at the crime scene. Right, so these notes are actually prepared while you're there to keep track of all of your observations and uh, information. Yes what, yes, what to go back to, uh, what I should be noting at that time. Uh, there's no measurements involved in those preliminary notes. That's the first, first run through the scene and talking to the officers. Excellent. And uh, these three pages are all of the notes that you took on the morning of June 13th. Is that correct? Well, I was stopped. Uh, I was in the process of taking notes, uh, putting my thoughts to, to paper, and I was told that uh, Robert Homicide would be taking over the case. I stopped taking notes at that point and uh, gave those notes to Detective Phillips who then passed them on to Detective Van Adder. Okay, so essentially you stopped taking notes because you believed you were off the case, is that correct? No, I knew I was off the case. It was no longer my case, so I stopped there because uh, the, the way that uh, they conducted the crime scene or their notes, uh, I would be given them mine and they would be taken over from that point. They review mine notes up to that point and then they continue making their own from the beginning of when they were arrived at the scene. Then, uh, uh, the, the notes actually stop at 875 South Bundy. Yeah, yes, sir. You yes. took no notes whatsoever of any of the events uh, in which you participated uh, at 360 North Rockingham. That's correct. When you uh, left the scene at uh, 875 uh, Bundy and went to the Rockingham address, uh, did you bring any of the evidence with you that you had encountered at the Bundy scene? I touched no evidence and I authored no reports. Now you indicated uh, yesterday that one of the uh, reasons that your attention was drawn to the white bronca uh, was because it was parked rather strangely, I believe, as you put it? Well, just when I, when I was walking towards it, it was, uh, the front of the truck was facing uh, my direction of travel, and it just looked, it just looked a little strange the way it was parked. All right. You you indicated that the front was much closer to the curb, and the back was out into the roadway. Well, it was just uh, wasn't parked uh, parallel to the curb. It looked like it was parked hurriedly or haphazardly. And uh, you indicated the wheels were turned in toward the curb. They were turned in towards the curb, uh, and that could be the way the vehicle was sitting with the rear end jutting out would give me that impression when I'm walking forward. I couldn't tell you how, how many degrees to the right they were. All right. Uh, Your Honor, could we uh, mark uh, Officer Furman's notes as uh, Exhibit E, Defense Exhibit E? All right, and you say that consists of three pages? Three pages. Yes, of the E. Uh, I'm handing you what uh, we mark as Exhibit E. Are those all of the notes you took uh, of your investigation in this case? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, now, we've also uh, located among the uh, photographs supplied to the defense uh, four pictures of the Bronco automobile taken the morning of uh, June 13th. If we could mark these uh, defense exhibit F, Your Honor. Yes. Uh, and they are numbered 1, 2, 3, and 4. Do those uh, uh, photographs accurately represent the uh, position of the Bronco automobile as you observed it uh, in the early morning hours of June 13th? <coughs> if I could point to the photos. Photo one we previously saw. Uh, photo two really doesn't show the direction I was walking in. Photo three, it seems that the camera is more to the left. When I was looking at the Bronco, I was several feet back, and I believe I was more to the right of the vehicle where the, the line of the vehicle seemed like the rear end was out a little bit more. Um, as you can see here in photo four, the right tire is about four inches onto the concrete part of the asphalt roadway where the rear tire is completely on the asphalt uh, with a couple inches to spare. And that's what I'm, I'm 
talking about it, it, it looked like it wasn't casually parked or carefully parked. It wouldn't be how I would probably park my vehicle. It just looked a little strange when I'm walking up on it. All right, but these photographs do accurately depict how the car was parked. I remember that it was more extreme, and I'm not sure that this photo shows the way my view of that was walking up towards it from a, a greater distance from this and a little more to the right. But I would say it would be fair to say that it fairly are, depicts. Are you suggesting the automobile was moved between the time you saw it and the time these photographs were taken? No, I'm not suggesting that at all. I'm just suggesting that where uh, our photographer took the photos from, it doesn't really show exactly where I was walking. I was walking almost in the middle of the roadway, walking down more to the right of the vehicle. I'm not saying it was moved. Uh -huh. It just seems that my view might have given me a more extreme angle than these photos show. OK. Now, when you walked up to the automobile, did you uh, check to see if the engine was warm? I uh, touched the, the hood, and it, and it was not warm. But uh, I also didn't feel any moisture, of course. I'm not sure uh, how much of a dew there was that morning. I, I also didn't look at the lawn, so. When you uh, first observed the stain uh, on the door, did the stain appear to be wet or damp? I didn't touch it, and it didn't appear like it was uh, flowing or moving. Uh, I, I would say it was, uh, it appeared to be dried. Now, I asked you yesterday about some uh, coffee stains. And you indicated uh, you did not observe any other uh, food stains or possible uh, coffee stains on the car. That's true. I didn't observe them. <coughs> uh, we've located three different uh, impound reports, uh, which appear in the murder book at 00108, 00110, and 00111. Uh, and I would ask that uh, these be marked as uh, exhibits G1, 2, and 3. Yes. Now, these are all uh, vehicle investigation reports related to a 1994 Ford Bronco 3 CWZ 788. That's the Bronco in question. Is that correct? I believe it is. I don't recall the plate. All right. Now, one of these reports is filled out when the automobile is moved. Is that correct? Well, yes. It could be filled out prior to, but uh, it, it's generally yes when the impound's completed. And the first of these reports uh, indicates uh, June 13th at 7.30 in the morning. Were you aware of the car being impounded at 7.30 in the morning? No. The uh, second of these reports, uh, uh, which refers to a time of June 13th at 3.30 in the afternoon, 15.30, uh, notes special instructions take vehicle to print shack, PAB across street of Parker Center, two coffee stains on hood, disregard, not related. What does that mean? Uh, <clears throat> Officer Don Thompson, who was handling the security on the Rockingham Gate, said that when the media was uh, at the scene and there was a, uh, a rush of activity, uh, one of the news people running by or walking by placed a cup on the hood of the uh, Bronco. They immediately grabbed it, uh, admonished him, you know, obviously don't do that again. And he informed me that there was coffee stains. I believe he also informed other detectives at the scene of the same thing. Now, had any yellow tape uh, or crime scene tape been placed around the automobile? No, and I, I believe the, the reason for that was is we didn't want to draw more attention to the vehicle than uh, we wanted at that point. We had two officers assigned specifically just to that vehicle to secure it. And they did that. And when the Russia media came by and the cup was put there, it, it was something that they really couldn't foresee and they really couldn't do anything about. OK. If we could uh, mark these reports, uh, Your Honor, uh, as G1, G2, and G3, are these the uh, vehicle reports? I've never seen these reports, sir. I want to take you back to uh, your Sir, entry. I might add that, uh, if I could, uh, I do recognize the name on the bottom of uh, 
the one report, uh, one of the authors of this report is Officer Thompson that talked to uh, me at the scene about right, the coffee stand. Is his name on, uh, on the first of those reports, the 7.30 a.m. report? Um, <clears throat> No, this is the, uh, the time of occurrence is 1530. That's Officer Thompson's report. I have no knowledge about the other two. All right. Uh, when you were in uh, uh, the room of Mr. Kalin, immediately after you went to the back of the premises at Rockingham, uh, were there any windows in that back wall of uh, Mr. Cato's room, or Mr. Kalin's room? Let me look at the chart. I can answer that, sir. There's no windows to that wall in Mr. Kalin's room. All right. I want to have you, uh, could, could we have uh, defense exhibit A? Your memory is that no windows in the back wall. No, there was windows in the back wall, uh, but there was no window at the wall where the air conditioning duct or uh, west of that air conditioning duct. On that wall in Mr. Cato's room, no, there wasn't. All right, well, let's, let's have you refer to where in the wall the, uh, the duct was. to uh, Defense Exhibit A, uh, would you point out where in that wall the uh, air conditioning unit was? <clears throat> Mr. Cato's room uh, is the first bungalow. Uh, the air conditioning duct was probably just a little off center of this wall of his room, uh, probably just to the right of his bed. Uh, there's no windows west of there. I'm not sure if there's a window for the bathroom. I'm positive there was a window, maybe two windows for Arnell's room. And I'm not positive in the back. I see a window that's depicted here, but I don't recall that. Did you uh, uh, make any effort to look through those windows at all to see if anyone was back there? To look through which windows, sir? The windows in the back wall of either the bathroom or Arnell's room. No, I didn't look through there, no. I believe, excuse me, but I believe this window, the one window here was the frosted type of opaque window. And I'm not positive, but this, I think, was a, a higher window, um, elevated past my uh, point of view. I'm not positive on that. All right. Uh, would you like to write a W where you indicated uh, uh, there was a window in Mr. Cato's bathroom. A little light of a pencil. Uh, you want a W where? At the location where there was a window uh, in Mr. Cato's room or the adjoining bathroom. I don't recall a, a window uh, in his bathroom. I said there possibly might have been one, but I know there was a couple windows when I went past the air conditioner, but I don't know if one of those was his window. All right, so you don't recall ever observing in the quarters occupied by Mr. Cato a window? No, I don't. Now, in uh, preparing your uh, testimony for yesterday and, and today, uh, did you confer with uh, the district attorneys who are prosecuting this case? Well, we, yes, we talked. Uh, was this just a conference between yourself and the district attorneys, or were the other detectives involved in the case present? No, we didn't talk about the, the case in the presence of the detectives. In fact, at, at one point, uh, uh, Marsh and I just talked uh, between ourselves, but it was nothing uh, very pointed, just uh, about the tactics of the defense. and. Uh, and that everything's everything's going fine. Just just tell tell everything that you did, and, and you're doing fine. All right. Now, was this uh, after the motion to suppress was filed a week ago today? I'm sorry. Are you, t are you talking about which conversation? 
the conversations with uh, uh, either Ms. Clark or Mr. Hodgman? We discussed my portion of this case prior to the motion to suppress. They asked me uh, just exactly what went down, and they said, well, we're comfortable with that, and that was pretty much it. So you did not have any discussions of any of these events after the motion was filed on June 29th? Well, we reiterated the same thing we talked about before. Uh, they said, you know, uh, what'd you do then? Much the same as they would be bringing me through a, a testimony, and uh, they felt comfortable with what uh, transpired and, and what I had to say. When you say they, who were you meeting with? Uh, Mr. Hodgkin and uh, uh, Ms. Clark. And were any other detectives present at that time? No, I, I talked to them uh, by themselves. Now, if you were uh, giving someone directions to, uh, to go to Mr. Simpson's home on Rockingham, how would you direct them? <coughs> From the Bundy location? Yes. I would probably say uh, go uh, northbound on, on Bundy to, uh, there's two ways. You could go eastbound on uh, San Vicente past Cliffwood to Rockingham or you could go up Cliffwood, northbound from San Vicente. Uh, that would probably be the easiest way. Uh, Cliffwood, northbound to Sunset, and Sunset east to either Bristol Circle, Rockingham, and then go northbound once again. Bristol Circle will eventually curb you around to uh, Rockingham. Cliffwood, if you went northbound from Sunset, would eventually bring you to Ashford, and uh, Rockingham would go directly to the house. Wouldn't the simplest way be to be just go up Bundy to Sunset and then go left to Rockingham? Well, it's the simplest in some of those streets is, is the ones that have lights to get across Sunset. And uh, the simplest way is not to get lost. If you give somebody Bristol Circle, it's kind of confusing. Uh, there's Bristol Court, there's Bristol Circle. Uh, it's kind of confusing. Right. Uh, and finally, uh, if you could uh, reiterate for us the precise time as you remember it that you first observed the glove uh, on the premises at 360 Rockingham. It's pretty hard to be precise, but I'll get as close as I can. Uh, we arrived at approximately 510. I'd just like to know the time that you observed the glove. Okay, if you give me a moment. probably say uh, approximately 6.15 to 6.30. 6.15 to 6.30? Maybe it could be as early as 6, but like I said, I, I didn't look at my watch at that point. <clears throat> Thank you. that was pointed out to you by uh, defense counsel just now concerning Officer Risky. That yes, was a, a radio call that was given to Officer Risky? No, I believe so. I just, uh, I had heard him uh, indicate that he heard the call. I don't know if it was directed at his uh, police unit or another unit, and he picked up the, uh, the audio part of the call. Uh, he just informed me of that situation. Uh, I didn't know if it was related at that time. Did you ever determine how a burglary call came to be placed concerning a murder investigation? No. Uh, once I was no longer part of the uh, primary investigative team, uh, I was at the direction of uh, Detective Ben Adder and Lang, and they, they uh, pretty much dictated the uh, investigative uh, path we were going to take, and that's why I gave them my notes. and. Uh, just followed their direction from the remainder of the time. What, if any, impact did that information concerning the radio call get received by Officer Risky have on your actions or your decisions on that night or early morning of June the 13th? Well, it would lend uh, the possibility that there was other people other than the two victims at the scene, uh, which corroborated the <laughs> footprints leading away from the scene. Uh, it would say that someone um, a victim, a suspect, or 
Uh, I believe if there was a call that said suspects, it could have been one. It could also have been uh, the struggle in front of the, the house. I, I had no idea because I never took it any farther. So did that radio call received by Officer Risky have any impact on the decisions you made later concerning the case, what to do as the events unfolded through the early morning hours of June the 13th? At the Bundy location? Right. Or? For me, no, because I was relieved of the responsibility of uh, decision making at that point. And uh, as I said, I was, I was just going at the direction of Detective Van Adder and Lang. Do you know whether they ever knew of that radio call that Officer Risky got concerning a burglary in progress? I know they received my notes, so I assume that uh, they read them and they, they did talk to Officer Risky. Uh, I was not privileged uh, to be there when they talked to Officer Risky, so. So you don't know what they found out about that? Or, all right. No. With respect to finding the glove, after you found the glove, what did you do? You saw the glove on the walk, then what did you do? I continued eastbound on the path that went to the rear of the property and I spent, uh, I'm not gonna say a considerable amount of time, I would estimate it to be about 15 minutes looking for uh, a person that, that could have uh, left that glove there, which really indicated that somebody was injured um, I continued to look in all places I believe a, a human could either secrete himself or collapse uh, in that area, and then I returned uh, to the front of the residence. So you walked all the way back to that back area that you've indicated earlier on the diagram, shown here behind our, what's marked as on the defense diagram as our Nell's room? Behind that location, yes. Then you walked all the way back up this path, is that what you're saying? Yes and all the way around through the driveway and into the front? I believe there was, uh, I believe Detective Phillips was standing in front of the residence and I, I spoke with him. And when you got inside, you said you spoke to the detectives? Yes. Which I believe, uh, I'm, I'm sorry? sorry. <clears throat> I believe Detective Phillips informed Detective Van Adder and Lang of, of the discovery and uh, they came out to me in the front. Did they come out one by one or all together? One by one. So, did you go with them each time? Yes. And who did you go with first? Detective Phillips. And what was the route you took with him? The same route that I took originally uh, from the front entrance, directly south in front of the garage, and then entering the uh, path going eastbound, continuing down, explaining uh, the areas and how and why I determined that the main house was separate by this corridor from the rest of uh, the bungalows and how the architecture changed, uh, how I was describing that to him and then how I looked down and saw the dark object uh, 15, 20 feet in front of me and got closer, I realized what it was. And it was right almost exactly where Mr. Kalin described a crashing noise. <coughs> And the area on the wall where he described the crashing noise, was there any window near to the area he described hearing the noise come from? No. So then after taking Detective Phillips down to that area and describing everything that you saw, who did you take next? Detective Van Adder. And did you do the same thing with him? Yes, exactly the same thing. And at, so each time you went, you took the detective all the way down to where the glove was and brought them all the way back? Yes. And then did you do the same with Detective Lang? Yes. <laughs> did you take any of the detectives all the way back to the area behind our Nell's room that you described going to yourself earlier? I, I don't believe so. I described that, uh, I described to, to Detective Phillips, and I'm almost positive I did to both the other detectives, how as soon as I scooted underneath the air conditioner, it pretty much covered the path. Uh, a little, ele it was elevated, but it covered the path. I ran into the spider webs and I, I told them that. I told them I looked in the area, but I didn't see anything that would lend us to believe that anybody was back in that area. When you said you scooted under the air conditioner, um, 
How did you have to scoop down? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, the, <clears throat> scoot down, and you don't have to get in your hands and knees, but you have to get down low. It, it goes on an angle. It, uh, it's an air conditioner that sticks out, uh, I, I don't know, a foot and a half, two feet, and then it has uh, braces that go at a 45 degree angle to the air conditioner that attaches to the uh, wall at the bottom below it. And after you took the, ver the last detective all the way back to show the glove, did you come back out to the front of the house? Yes. And what did you do then? Uh, I didn't do anything. I just, I just stood there and waited. And uh, I went in and I, I heard a, a discussion uh, by Detective Van Adder and uh, a comment uh, made shortly thereafter about uh, we're going to have to handle this like a crime scene. Do you, ha do you know approximately what time that was when you heard that discussion? No, after, after this I came out front. Uh, to be honest with you, I was a little taken back by what had transpired. Um, we didn't enter with any intention of finding anything there. And I just kind of stood out there and uh, I was really kind of collecting my thoughts. When I found the glove back here on this pathway, um, I'll have to, I, I have to admit to you that uh, the adrenaline started pumping because I didn't really know uh, what was going on and uh, no matter if I found a victim or a suspect, uh, I still had a, some type of a very serious situation at that time and uh, I think I was coming down from that a little bit. You mean when you say the adrenaline, you mean from seeing the crime scene? No. From seeing when the glove? I, when I found the glove and, and actually realized that this glove was very close uh, in description and color uh, to the glove at the crime scene, my heart started pounding and uh, I, did, I realized what I had probably found. When that gets going and you never get a chance to run it off or uh, get rid of it, you get kind of a, a downtime. And uh, I think I was collecting my, not composure, but my thoughts a little bit out front. And so while you were collecting your thoughts and relaxing after uh, your discovery, you heard a discussion going on inside the house? Yes, I, I walked into the, the front of the residence and in the kitchen, uh, Detective Lang and Van Adder were discussing uh, what's been found. I believe Detective Phillips was there also, and they were uh, discussing, you know, that we've really got another crime scene here, and then I, I heard search warrant brought up. We're going to have to get a search warrant. Detective Van Adder said that, and uh, I don't know exactly what time that was. You, you were not in the frame of mind to examine your watch or look at a clock. Like I said before, I was kind of taken back by the whole event, so we didn't go up there for this. And uh... uh, Detective Furman. Uh, who was in charge at the Rockingham scene? Which of the four detectives? Uh, Detective Van Adder. And uh, like yourself, uh, Detective Phillips had been relieved uh, of further responsibility in the case? Well, it, <clears throat> at that time, uh, there was actually uh, three detectives that responded to the Bundy scene. Uh, myself, Detective Phillips, and, and Detective Roberts. He got there after us. Uh, he was interviewing uh, witnesses I believe the witnesses that uh, saw the dog. Uh, he had gone to West LA Station. So while we were there uh, at the scene, we were all relieved. Uh, now, with respect to the excitement you felt at uh, encountering the glove, uh, you realized immediately that uh, this may have broken the case? Uh, I don't think it was excitement. Uh, I was caught on a two-foot path in a poorly lit with a little tiny flashlight by myself with no vest. And I, I must admit that um, I think the only reason I proceeded is, is I felt 
more that I might have had a, a victim than a suspect. I, I don't know why I thought that. Like I said, I did not believe the circumstances would unfold as they did when I led these detectives up to Rockingham. I continued um, probably hoping that I could uh, find uh, some answer for this glove or somebody that had been injured or something, uh, but it was more alert than excitement. Um, and, and the first person to whom you reported finding the glove uh, was Detective Phillips, is that correct? Yes, he was in front of the residence. Uh, he was the first person I saw, and I said, Ron, come here, i got to talk to you. And you took Detective Phillips back to see the glove before you even informed Detective Van Adder that the glove had been found? Yes. All right, so uh, Van Adder learned about the glove, what, about a half hour after you found it? No. Uh, I, I think it would be within 15 minutes, maybe well, you 10. You indicated that uh, you spent 15 minutes after you saw the glove searching this area behind the house. Oh, I thought you meant after I talked to Detective Phillips. Uh, yes, after. I did do that, and then I came to talk to Detective then Phillips. And you came to talk to, Profe right. to Detective Phillips and took him back? Right. That took, what, about another 15 minutes? 10 or 15. All right. So Detective Van Adder learned about the glove for the first time a half hour after you discovered it. That could be that be that could be very close to the time. Thank you. Yes. Nothing. For Anything for Ms. Clark? Detective Furman, you're estimating time for us now, are you not? Yes, I can't remember. Uh, outside of being at the crime scene on Bundy, um, I didn't look at my watch much at all that morning. And at the Rockingham address again, are these estimates of time, the amount of time that lapsed between certain events? Absolutely. Thank you. I have nothing further. Anything further, Mr. Olman? Nothing further. Thank you, Detective. I remind you that uh, you are not to discuss your testimony with any other witness in this matter. You can discuss it with the lawyers if necessary, that that's all. You may step yes, down. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Ullman, exhibits G, 1, 2, and 3 are on the witness stand. Would you mind collecting those, please? Sir. All right, Detective, you were sworn yesterday in connection with these proceedings. So you may retake the witness stand. I remind you that you are still under oath. Yes, Your Honor. State your name for the record. Philip Van Adder. Spell your last name, please. B is in Victor, A-N-N-A-T-T-E-R. Ms. Clark. Thank you, Your Honor. <coughs> Detective Van Adder, tell us what you do for a living. Yes, I'm a police detective, uh, Los Angeles Police Department, uh, assigned to Robbery Homicide Division, Homicide Special Section. And how long have you been assigned to Homicide Special Section of the Robbery Homicide Division? Well, I've been assigned to Robbery Homicide Division for 15 years, the Homicide Special Section for about eight years. How long have you been on the force altogether? 25 and a half years this month. And how many homicides have you investigated in, in those 25 and a half years? Well, I've been assigned actually working homicides uh, started in 1973, and have probably been personally involved in over 200, and have probably been to or assisted in five to 600 crime scenes. Can you tell us uh, what the Robbery Homicide Division does? <coughs> I can tell you what the Homicide Special Section does, yes. Okay. We are a, a section set up to handle uh, high profile or very involved or serial type murder investigations. And in that regard, sir, uh, with respect to the case now before the court, uh, you, what is your role in this case? What is my role? I, yes. was, I was assigned this case that uh, I got the original phone call on the 13th of June at 3 o'clock in the morning, responded to the scene, and took charge of the investigation. So you're, you are one of the investigating officers in charge of this case? That's correct, yes. And how many others are there? Well, there's my partner, Detective Tom Lane. 
And is he also assigned to the uh, robbery homicide, homicide special? Yes. And you got the call, you tell us, at 3 o'clock in the morning? I got, I got the original phone call at my home at 3 o'clock in the morning. That's correct. And what, where did you go pursuant to that call? I was instructed to go to 875 South Bundy. Uh, I prepared myself and uh, responded to that location. What time did you arrive? At 4.05 in the morning. What did you see when you got there? I was met by uh, Detective Ron Phillips and Detective Mark Furman. Uh, Detective Phillips is the homicide coordinator for West Los Angeles Division. I was told that uh, there was a double homicide at that location and that one of the victims had been identified as Nicole Simpson. Uh, Detective Phillips further told me that uh, two minor children, two small children, had been taken from the residence and were presently in custody at the uh, West LA Division. Now, did someone walk you through the crime scene so that you could see uh, what, what you had there? Yes. Who was that? Detective Phillips gave me a walkthrough of the crime scene. Now, when you say a walkthrough, did you step through the evidence? No, no. Well, I, uh, we approached the, the actual scene of the two victims through a planter area that would have been uh, south of the, of the actual location of the two victims. And, Go ahead. and then after viewing that location, he gave me a walk through the walkway that headed west to the back of the apartment building that led to the alley. So you stood from a position where you would not disturb anything in terms of the crime scene or the evidence in it? Definitely. I was standing in the foliage in a planner. Can you please describe for us the condition in which you found the victims in this case? Yes. Uh, Nicole Simpson was lying at the, at the entrance gate on the walkway right in front of the front step that stepped up to go up toward the uh, residence. The gate was open, and uh, Ron Goldman was lying directly north of her location in a planter area that would have been on the north side of the uh, walkway. Now, were you able to tell what the cause of death was at that point? No, I could not. It, it, it appeared to be massive injuries. There was a lot of blood. Uh, blood had actually drained and run down the walkway toward the sidewalk. There was a lot of blood there. I, I, I couldn't tell other than there was some type of massive injury. Now, were you able to see any evidence uh, near the, either one of the victims? Yes. What did you see? I saw at the feet of Ron Goldman uh, a man's leather glove, left-handed leather brown glove. Just below that, which would have been just directly southeast of that, was a, a blue knit watch cap. Also between the two victims, I saw a white envelope lying on the ground. There was a set of keys and a pager. Did you go in, did you go into any other areas of the crime scene to examine them other than that front area where you saw the victims? Yes. Where did you go? Detective Phillips took me west on the walkway that would be on the north side of the residence uh, to show me, and I observed bloody footprints leading, appeared to be leading from the actual crime scene, the locations of the two victims to the rear of the building along the walkway. I also observed as he's showing me, as we're going through blood droplets that appear to be not associated with the two victims, as if the person leaving the bloody footprints was dropping blood from something, as they appeared to be straight down drops on the ground. Did they appear to you, those blood drops, to be alongside the bloody uh, footprints? Yes, definitely. Now, when we say footprints, was those, were those bare footprints? No, they were shoe prints. 
You, could you see a definite heel in those prints? There was a pattern, yes. I could see a pattern. And I, I'm sorry, did you say, to what side of the flip footprints did you see the blood drops? The left side. Thank you. <clears throat> Now, having made, uh, having made the observations that you did at the crime scene, sir, uh, did you continue to confer with the West L.A. detectives, uh, Detective Furman and Detective Phillips? Yes, that's correct. Why, why did you do that if this was your case? Well, I was waiting for the arrival of my partner, who was approximately 20 to 25 minutes behind me. Uh, I instructed the two uh, West L.A. detectives that we would take charge of the scene, and uh, I waited for my partner to arrive to acclimate him with the scene also. At some point, did you leave the scene of 875 South Bundy? Yes. <clears throat> Why'd you do that? Well, a number of uh, reasons. Uh, knowing that uh, one of the victims had been identified as uh, Nicole Simpson, knowing that her husband or ex-husband at that point was a very well-known person, that we had two children in custody, two minor children that had been taken from this <coughs> very traumatic scene. We made a determination to go to Mr. Simpson's residence in an attempt to notify him of the death before the media got, got word of it, and to also make arrangements for the disposition of the two children that were his children. So who went, went with you to uh, the uh, location that, of Mr. Simpson's residence? There were three others besides myself, myself and my partner, and Detective Furman and uh, Detective Phillips. Why did Detective Phillips and Detective Furman go with you? They had been originally involved in the investigation. They were assisting us, and, uh, and we went up there for a number of reasons. Again, I say, also knowing the close proximity of the crime scene to where Mr. Simpson lived, uh, it was also my feeling, my belief, that we needed to check the welfare up there also. Was a, this was a very traumatic, uh, bloody scene. Tell me, sir, um, so you drove actually that night from 875 South Bundy to uh, 360 Rockingham Avenue? That's correct. Can you estimate for us about how long it took you to get from 875 South Bundy to 360 Rockingham Avenue? Probably not more than five minutes. So what happened when you got to the Rockingham Avenue address? We drove up uh, Rockingham uh, north from Sunset Boulevard to Ashford Street, and turned uh, right east and parked at the curb and uh, walked to the gate, and, and as I drove in, I noticed a white Ford Bronco parked at the, which would be the east curb of uh, Rockingham. Parked uh, on the Ashford uh, south curb, and got out and attempted to utilize the intercom to, to raise someone in the home. And the intercom that you're talking about, where was that located? The intercom is located on the east side of the uh, Ashford Street gate. And looking at this diagram, it would have been right in this area right here. For the record, the witness has pointed to the area where what appears to be a wall indicated up by the Ashford Street um, meets the edge of the driveway that is to the right the right edge of the driveway at that corner. When you, was that a button you pressed? Yes, that's correct. When you pressed the button, did you hear anything? Yes, I could hear the phone ringing inside the uh, residence. Did you get any response? No. When you drove to the Ashford Street side, did you come up Rockingham first? Yes, that's correct. As you drove up Rockingham, did you notice whether there were any cars parked outside the Rockingham gate in front of the residence? Yes, I did. And what did you notice? I noticed a white Ford Bronco parked at the east curb of uh, Rockingham, just 
north of the Rockingham Gate to the uh, residence. Showing you the exhibits that have previously been marked as collectively People's Aid. Can you tell me if you recognize what you see there in photograph A, B, and C? Yes, I do. What is that? That's the Ford Bronco that was parked at the curb. So you rang the first time and you received no answer. What did you do next? Well, we rang the bell for a period of time, probably 10 to 15 minutes, attempting to raise someone in the residence. There was a light on on the bottom floor. It appeared to be on the toward the south side of the house. And there was also a light on in the upstairs portion of the home. Uh, we rang the bell for a period of time trying to get some response, and we didn't. Could you estimate how long you rang the bell for without getting a response? Oh, I believe it was in the area of 10 to 15 minutes, probably. During this time, I noticed a West Tech security sign, which is a private security company that works in that area. And I requested uh, Detective Phillips to contact them to see if we could get a telephone number for the uh, residents. And did he do so? Yes. Did he have to, did you have a phone with you? A mobile uh, phone? He did, I didn't. Did he use that yes. to make a phone call to West Tech? Yes. And after making that phone call, what happened next? We continued to ring the bell. Uh, in the meantime, I walked back around while the other detectives were there. I walked back around and looked at the Ford Bronco and noticed that the Bronco was parked uh, like it had been hastily parked at the curb with the front end a little closer to the curb than the rear end. And uh, Detective Furman was with me or there when I got there. And he directed me to look in the rear of the vehicle. In the rear, there was a package that was addressed, I believe, to Orenthal Productions. There was a shovel and a piece of plastic wrapped up in it. I asked the package. That, I'm sorry, sir, but the package that you said was addressed to Orenthal Productions, did that mean something to you? Well, yeah, it indicated to me that it was most likely Mr. Simpson's vehicle because I knew his name was Orenthal. Okay. I asked Detective Furman to run a Department of Motor Vehicle registration check on the vehicle. Did he give you the results of that check? Yes. And what was the result? That the vehicle was registered to Hertz Corporation. And what, if any, significance did that information have to you? Well, I knew that, I knew that Mr. Simpson was a spokesperson for, for Hertz Corporation.